1. Let's review Ives comeback with Haya. Ive has been on a roll, no doubt, they've got that Midas touch for the charts, with I am still charting, it's clinging on like it's got some serious abandonment issues, but let's talk about their last comeback baddie for a sec, they tried to switch lanes musically, and honestly, it was like watching someone try to fit a square peg in a round hole, awkward and kinda forced, the whole girl crush vibe. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, now, new comeback Haya is strutting in, trying to marry baddie s hip-hop vibes with something that's supposed to be more melodically meaty, and who do they bring to the mix? Dem Joints, one of NCT's producers, his fingerprints are all over this track, and it's like he brought a sledgehammer to the percussion section, but then there's the elephant in the room, the no diggity sample, it's like they're trying to serve us 90s realness on a silver platter, but it ends up feeling like reheated leftovers, the chorus is having an identity crisis, is it an anthem or just a wannabe? It's like they're stuck in a loop of should we, shouldn't we, and it's not doing them any favors, but hey, it's not all doom and gloom, when I've, gets gutsy with that pre-chorus switch up, it's like they hit their stride, that's the I've, we want to see more of the back and forth in the verses is catchy, sure, but it's dragging its feet with that slow mo beat, it's like the song's itching to break into a sprint but forgot how to tie its shoelaces, so, what's the verdict on Haya? It's middle of the pack, better than baddie, but still lagging behind the bangers we know they can deliver, it's like they're playing it safe when they should be doubling down on the wild card that made us all sit up and listen in the first place. 2. Hybe and Min Hee Jin don't give a crap, these two are the puppet masters behind the scenes, pulling strings with the finesse of a cat playing with yarn, they've got the power, the clout, and the bank accounts, but do they care? Honey, caring is so last season, now, I've seen the fandom chatter, crying what about Illit? What about new jeans? Why would Hybe and Min Hee Jin do what they did? Don't they know how it'll impact the girls? Listen up, these companies are not your fairy godmothers, they're more like the wicked stepmother, cackling as they count their stacks of cash, Companies don't care about their artists at the core, nope, not even a smidgen, they care about one thing, money. K-pop is a business, and business is cutthroat, if they do something nice for their idols, it's because a happy idol equals a fat wallet, and don't even get me started on the fact that shareholders rule the roost, these faceless overlords in their ivory towers care about one thing, return on investment, if sacrificing an artist's sanity means a fatter dividend check, they'll sharpen their guillotines faster than you can say encore, so, Next time you see a company tweet about family and love, remember this, they're just swiping right on their profit margins, idols. Oh, they're replaceable, like expired milk in a convenience store. 3. Yuchi's solo debut with Freak was a letdown. I was expecting a rock banger from Yuchi, but what did we get? Freak, a track that's trying to be the bad boy of K-pop but ends up sitting at the kid's table we wanted edge, we got safety scissors, I mean, do y'all remember her last title track Bonnie and Clyde, the anthem that set the bar sky high? Fast forward to Freak, and it's like expecting a dragon but getting a gecko, sure, it's got a bit of that rock vibe, but it's wrapped up in so much plastic, it's practically recyclable. Reviewing K-pop is usually a lyrical blind date, it's all about the sound, but throw in too much English, and suddenly it's like tripping over your own feet, Freak is guilty as charged, it's like it wants to be the rebel yell, but it ends up being a rebel whisper, Yuchi's looking for a certified Freak, but honey, those trap beats and whispered guitars ain't fooling anyone, and that voice of hers, rich and raspy, deserves more than a half-baked hook, Freak is like G-Idol's wild child that never really got wild, it's all dressed up with nowhere to go, selling us a rebellion that's been focus grouped to death, it's got the punk look down, but where's the fire, where's the fury, just crickets, 4, let's review Zico's collab with Jenny, spot, it's been a hot minute since we've had fresh beats from Zico or Blackpink, so this collab has got everyone's ears perked up, Hybe are playing 4D chess here, trying to slide this track into the chaos of Minhejin like a smooth criminal, but let's face it, the current Hybe drama is more gripping than a season finale cliffhanger, no easy feat to overshadow, now, onto the track spot. Those teasers had us bracing for impact with that ear-piercing siren synth that's like a fire alarm at 3am, nobody's a fan, thankfully. The full song isn't just an onslaught of that noise, instead, we get a throwback to the slit grooves of the early 2000s, courtesy of the Neptune's playbook, it's the kind of beat that makes you want to bust out your old baggy jeans and trucker hat, Zico, and Jenny though? They're like two heavyweight champs going at it in the ring, except the fights got more style than substance, their deliveries got more punch than the actual lyrics, which are about as deep as a kiddie pool, but hey, they've got charisma to sell, and they're peddling that up and down, round and round like it's going out of style, and let's keep it 100, this track's got hit written all over it, it's got that stick in your head, play on repeat until you can't stand it vibe, not the kind of jam I'd have on my speed dial, but it's got that sticky factor that'll have it climbing the charts and racking up streams faster than you can say next big thing, commercially? It's a goldmine, artistically?
Well, it's a bop that knows its job. 5. Stan's weaponizing achievements is embarrassing. So, picture this, a bunch of Stans, armed with their calculators and receipts, ready to throw shade like it's a full-time job. They're out here arguing over achievements and numbers like it's the Olympics of pettiness. And what's the prize? Well, it's the gold medal in Insecurity Olympics. First off, let's address the elephant in the room, obsessing over numbers. These folks act like they're auditing the Federal Reserve, dissecting every digit like it holds the secrets of the universe. But guess what? It's not about appreciation. It's about sweating bullets because they're scared their faves won't measure up. Now, let's talk about those 24-hour MV views. Imagine the panic when another group snatches a measly 10 extra views, the drama, the horror. They're clutching their pearls, fearing that some rival fandom will slap those views on a PowerPoint presentation and present it like a Nobel Prize. But wait, there's more. Add views. These stands are like forensic accountants, dissecting MV metrics like it's a crime scene. Oh, look, 30% add views. My faves are basically Beyonce. No, sweetie, they're just afraid that other groups are pulling off more ad less views than a budget Netflix subscription, and don't get me started on the sales by Country Saga, apparently. If your faves sell like hotcakes in Uzbekistan, it's irrelevant. Girl please, these stands are so insecure that they dismiss a country's sales faster than a Tinder swipe left, like girl, K-pop is not the Hunger Games arena. 6. The way Zico introduced Boy Next Door was smart, when it comes to 5th gen, we have groups that went all out with their grand reveals, like Zero Basion, Baby Monster, and Illit, who strutted onto the scene with their resumes in hand, with survival show hype and some already known trainees. On the other side, Rise and Kiss of Life took a different route, they had secret weapons, ex-idols and trainees with fanbases already in place, it's like they whispered, hey, remember that guy from that other group? Well, he's back, and he brought friends, instant hype, smart move, but not exactly groundbreaking, enter Zico, and he decided to keep Boy Next Door under wraps like a top-secret government experiment, no leaks, no spoilers, just a bunch of question marks floating around, and you know what? It worked, Zico handpicked fresh faces, no recycled idols or trainees with baggage, and when Boy Next Door finally stepped into the spotlight, it was like watching a magician reveal the rabbit from the hat, tada newbies, but with a twist, no preconceived notions, no fandom wars waiting to erupt, just a clean slate and a dash of intrigue. Now, let's address the elephant in the practice room. Hate, oh, the internet loves to hate, ZB1, Rise, Illit, Baby Monster, and Kiss of Life have got their fair share, lineup controversies, member drama, and enough shade to block out the sun, but boy next door? They slipped in quietly, sure, they had their logo and debut promotion, but it was Loki, no fireworks, no confetti cannons, just a polite nod and a hey, we're here, and you know what? It paid off, Boy Next Door didn't explode overnight, they simmered, marinated, and built a loyal fanbase, Zykers followed suit, growing steadily, no hate storms, no cancel culture mobs, why? Because the spotlight wasn't blinding them, it's like being a B-list celebrity, fame light, you get to breathe without paparazzi camping outside your dorm, so, kudos to Zico. His approach was like wrapping Boy Next Door in bubble wrap and it worked.